good evening, ladies and gentlemen of my target demographic. Uh, I should say, this is a little embarrassing, I had intended to do a piece this evening uh, about a woman I met when I answered her Craigslist ad and claimed to be named Adam. <laughs> Also, uh, I, I don't know if there was supposed to be an outro that was missed, but let me say that Jean Franzblau, who you just saw, can be found at uh, cuddlesanctuary.com, and she has a cuddle game that you can purchase, uh, and when I purchase that game, I will play it while thinking of Jean Franzblau, <laughs> whose story you just heard. <laughs> The story began before you knew the story had begun because it began with the end of the previous story, which is hardly worth telling. <laughs> hardly worth remembering, even, were it not the beginning of the story that you hope will be worth telling. You hope it will be worth telling many times. When the girl came home with the stick in the vase, though, you did not know it was the start of a story. You did not know it was the start of the end. You just knew that she had a stick in a vase that she presented with enthusiasm you deemed unwarranted. <laughs> she said it was a psychic orchid that could only bloom under very specific circumstances, that it could only bloom in the presence of true, deep, real love. You said, oh. <laughs> because you didn't want to be a dick. <laughs> And because you wanted just a little bit to believe such a thing could exist. She said, when it blooms, it will be the most beautiful purple flower you have ever seen. And you said, oh. <laughs> because you still didn't want to be a dick. And also, you had been trying to figure out how to end the relationship for a while now. <laughs> And you were pretty sure that if the orchid bloomed, it would just prove that it wasn't psychic at all. It was just an orchid with a good PR guy. But it didn't even look like an orchid. It looked like a stick in a vase. Then she told you how much a fictitiously psychic flower costs to purchase, and you could no longer not be a dick. <laughs> so you said you spent $300 on a fucking stick in a vase? Are you out of your mind? Then there was an argument. <laughs> And you apologize, even though you didn't actually feel you had done anything wrong. <laughs> then she apologized and confessed that she was pretty sure she'd been conned into buying a stick in a vase for three hundred dollars. <laughs> with your credit card. <laughs> Then you kissed and had sex, and the next morning and the next few mornings you ate breakfast with her, pretending not to be aware of the stick in the vase on the table between you. <laughs> pretending not to be aware that it had not bloomed, that it was probably not psychic or even an orchid, and pretending most of all, pretending hardest of all, that you had not found the receipt that revealed it had cost nearly twice as much as she had confessed that night. <laughs> When she yelled at you that you were not romantic enough, not spontaneous enough, and too, too judgmental. When she stormed out with a backpack full of the stuff of hers that she kept at your apartment. It was really more of a relief than anything, even if the apartment did seem sadly quiet once she had gone. You noticed, after a few days, that you had started talking to the stick in a vase <laughs> You would nod to it and say, hey, how am I feeling? <laughs> it 
never answered and it never bloomed. It was a stick in a vase that had cost almost $600, though, and somehow it seemed wrong to just throw it out. Then, one night, you walk down to the Lambros Diner where the coffee is bad and the tuna melt is amazing for an amazing tuna melt and a bad cup of coffee. <laughs> Stay with the crowd, sir. <laughs> That's when you see the girl. Not the girl who walked out. The other girl. The girl. The part of you that studied philosophy a long time ago starts to compose sentences about the archetype of girl, about the platonic girl ideal. Although the ideas you have about this girl are not platonic, ideally. <laughs> she sits with a man and she smiles when she talks, so you try not to stare, but that is not easy. That is not easy at all. She wears those boots that women wear. The ones that come up above the calf, but not quite to the knee. The ones that make you think of Amelia Earhart, and for no reason that you have been able to figure out, despite discussing it in therapy. Of, of Louise Del Macher from third grade who came very close to kissing you in the cloakroom before the bell rang and she ran back out to class. The girl also has a fingerless glove on one hand like the ones hackers wear in refrigerated rooms full of bleeding edge computers in movies from the early 90s. <laughs> She doesn't wear the one glove to be quirky. She does it because she's taken the other one off to wrap her bare palm around a coffee cup. But the unintentional quirkiness is better than any intentional quirkiness could possibly have been anyway. Oh, I collect umbrellas. <laughs> What the man looks like doesn't matter. She matters. With hair the color of perfect girl hair. <laughs> she sips her coffee and her lips squeeze in as she swallows and then widen into a smile. Her eyes almost catch yours before you go back to not seeming as though you're staring. But when you glance back it seems as though she might be not seeming as though she's staring at you just as much. It might be a figment of your imagination. She might actually not be staring. <laughs> but the more you think about it, the more it seems as though she might be not seeming like she's staring at you intentionally. She is beautiful. She is too beautiful. She is much too beautiful. You can only eavesdrop in moments when the sound dies down in the diner. But from what you can gather, she's something, 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 43 pages in. <laughs> and then she had trouble finding something. Also, the something has been making a funny noise, but she doesn't know anyone who knows how to fix those. You wonder if those are something you might know how to fix. <laughs> that would be such a short list of things. <laughs> very productive for this story. <laughs> you wonder if she's 43 pages into reading or into writing something. You wonder if she's trying not to seem as though she's staring at you right now as you look at your coffee, trying not to seem as though you're staring at her. Eventually, you are out of tuna melt and have had too much coffee. You get up and walk home in the chill night air. You notice on the way that you are cold and wonder if that can be an indication that something important is happening, or has just happened, or is just about to happen. Then you realize three things. Thing one is that you have left your jacket at the diner. <laughs> not want to be perceived as forgetful or bumbling by this beautiful girl whom you have begun to think of as the girl. Thing three 
is that you have not turned around to retrieve the jacket. <laughs> because you would rather walk home cold and lose a favorite article of clothing <laughs> than risk having her perceive you as forgetful or bumbling. <laughs> you get home. And you will not realize until later that you do not ask the stick in a vase how you're feeling. <laughs> you know exactly how you're feeling. You're feeling chilled from the night air, but a little sweaty nonetheless. You're feeling excited and intrigued and beguiled. You're feeling jittery, although you suspect that's from all the coffee. <laughs> and you're feeling a little bit surprised by your casual internal use of the word beguiled. <laughs> Who am I, Ira Gershwin? <laughs> <laughs> uh, when a knock comes at the door, you know. You pretend not to know because the disappointment would be too great. But you know, and thinking back on it, you know you knew. It is the girl. It is the girl. She holds your jacket and says, I'm really sorry you left this and it had a few of your business cards in it. You want to say thank you. You want to say I'm so glad you came. You want to say you are the most beautiful girl I have ever seen. What you say is, my business cards don't have my address on them. <laughs> she says, I googled the phone number. You take the jacket and stand for a moment, not knowing how it goes from here, not knowing your lines. Her gaze shifts past you, and you think that maybe you've lost her attention. Maybe that was the only chance you got, and you blew it. But she says, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And when you turn around to follow her gaze, you see the brightest purple of the most blooming orchid, and you think, filled with hope for the first time in more than a year, maybe this is it. You think this might be the beginning of a story worth telling. Thank you.